I love experiencing new places by bike. The things that you see and interact with, I think are just a lot more like humanistic. So I love whenever I'm visiting cities, I love riding a bike through any city because just the way you experience the city is, is different. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, December 10th, 2021, and this is episode number 102, the second episode in season three. I hope you all caught the premiere of last week's episode with Professor Natalia Barber of TU Delft in the Netherlands. If not, you'll definitely want to go back and catch it, preferably on video format, because it's a very visual episode. Today, I'm excited to share this conversation I had last week with Sarah Abel, a transportation planner with a passion for safe systems design. We cover a lot of ground, including how a safety town from her childhood probably planted those initial seeds of interest, what a safe systems approach is, and the need for more creative and flexible curb management strategies. But before we roll into all that, please allow me a brief moment to say that this episode is being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. And I do want to send a special shout out to Ryan Hale with Lane Shift in Northwest Arkansas. I really appreciate your generous contribution and all the amazing work that you, Ben, and your entire team are doing to help get more people riding more often. And if you too would like to contribute, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate over to the donation page. Every donation, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated and has a big impact on my ability to continue doing this work. As many of you know, I like mentioning that there are many other ways that you can help support my efforts that don't involve money. Here are just a few. The first, if you're listening to this episode, is to simply subscribe to the audio podcast on your preferred listening platform or podcatcher. The second, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, is to subscribe to the Active Towns channel. And be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll get a reminder when I post new videos, which is typically one per week. And finally, please help me spread the word about the Active Towns Initiative and this episode by sharing it with a friend or anyone you think might be interested or could benefit from this content. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get this conversation with Sarah Abel rolling. Sarah Abel, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. Hey, John. Good to be joining you. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we had some technical difficulties uh, the last time with some of the graphics and some of the visuals. But uh, and since we're, we're, we want to do this as a very interactive and immersive thing where we're showing some pretty pictures and all that. We want to, wanted to do this again. Uh, so why don't we do this? Why don't we have you uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, uh, and, and maybe just kind of how you got interested in this uh, field of work. Yeah, definitely. So um, I have an architecture and planning background. Um, I have uh, done everything from working for nonprofits to public agencies um, to consultants um, and kind of became a, a expert in uh, complete streets work, building green and complete streets in rural areas. It's kind of how I got into transportation, but I'm also a general land use planner. Um, and most recently, I just departed the Institute of Transportation Engineers as the transportation planning director and am in the process of joining tool design as the safe, sustainable safety practice lead. Very cool. Excellent. So, I'm going to pull up a photo here, and this is a photo from your past that you have shared with me. And uh, it, what, what's funny is what, the first image that I get when I when I think about this is I, I think of like a um, like a storage unit location. 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I, I think you know what I mean. Let, let me, let's pull this up. I hope not, because storage unit like, I know. is a land it's use. Like it's totally, like not the highest and best it's use. Like, <laughs> it's like totally not the highest and best use uh, of it. Yeah. But this is what I mean. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, definitely. So long before I went to architecture and planning school, um, I am the daughter of a first responder. Um, and uh, this is a um, miniature town known as Safety Town. Okay. Um, a lot of first responders help train kids on the basic rules of the road, how to safely cross a street, what stop signs are for, how to stop at a stop sign. So this is Safety Town. It's a miniature town um, where kids bring their breath bikes, skateboards, um, walk, rollerblades, um, and they learn the rules of the road. And I shared this with you because I think that this was actually the origin of me being interested in the built environment and in transportation in in general. Um, so as a um, young kindergartner, I attended Safety Town um, and I loved it, the, both the architecture and the um, and the street um, and learning the rules of the road. And then later on, like around middle school, I would go back and help volunteer with my dad, who was a firefighter, um, to teach kids that were younger than me um, uh, the rules of the road in Safety Town. And fun fact, since my dad was a firefighter, a couple of these buildings to teach kids um, also how to safely get out of a structure in the event of a fire. Um, the fire department lights a couple of these buildings on fire, um, hmm. not literally, but figuratively to teach kids stop, drop, and roll, oh. um, as well as how to like find a door by um, patting things, how to know if a door is hot or cold so it's safe to exit. So it's all right. things safety. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the origin of where I think I like started thinking about the built environment the way that I did, the, the way that I do now. Right, right. You started thinking about that. So I zoomed out a little bit so that we could get a little bit more of the, the scale and the scope of the streetscape here. And you can see that it's in miniature. So it's, it, it's like the, when the kids are, are out there learning, uh, you know, how to, you know, cross the street at the sidewalk and you know, they're, they're on their bikes in, in the street and they're doing that. I've always been curious about these types of, of safety town um, uh, projects. And uh, some of them are, do they go by other names like safety garden? Traffic garden, Traffic safety garden. gardens. Thank yeah. you. There's kind so, of two organizations, one out here in D.C., mm -hmm. which is Traffic Gardens, and then mm -hmm. uh, Safety Town is more Midwestern-based. Um, okay. I think they're they're a nonprofit organization based out of Ohio, I believe. Right. Okay. So here's here's my thought that it, it, it was always curious to me um, that there was the, the, the scope of them were always so incredibly auto-centric. Yeah, yeah, it's so funny looking at this now as a trained professional working right. in Vision Zero and Safe System. Obviously, this starts to teach kids traffic control devices, but it's as though you're a kid on a bike who really is a car. We're not teaching necessarily kids um, uh, how to be a bike safely on a street, which is, is of course, very important. Um, I look at this and like it's uh, um, the crosswalks. I would want to change them to a high visibility crosswalk so that we start to teach kids right. um, that become adults like the safest way for streets to look um, also from the from the architecture standpoint obviously this is a miniature suburbia right. so to teach more of an urban environment um, but I still think that the concepts um, as a child that are very um, kind of basic can yeah. translate across the board. I will say that even though like this is auto centric, kids learn how to look both ways before crossing the street. And they kind of understand the interaction of a pedestrian versus car and how that is taught. I also think that this is just like a creative way for kids to understand the built environment. I've seen some of the more newer traffic gardens um, like in DC that um, have murals painted in the playground area. Um, I like this one. And this is, of course, the one that I went to as a kid in Illinois. Um, but at least this one's like a gridded street. Some of the traffic gardens you see like meandering mm -hmm. um, 
streets more like suburbia, so grid versus um, versus non-grid, and teaching kids that. But I've also worked on Safe Routes to Schools programs, um, which require a community engagement and uh, and uh, interaction with the children about uh, streets. And I've built these temporarily out of like bike boxes and right. refrigerator boxes, let kids build their building, and then teach them the rules of the road. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of creative ways to do this to show the good and the bad, the autocentric versus the vulnerable road user lens. So yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things that we see quite uh, frequently when we, we visit the Netherlands is the, the students and the kids out there in their environment, you know, learning and, and, and figuring out how to get around. And it's, it's both with their parents as well as, as part of the school curriculum. By the time they're 12 years old, they have, actually have to pass an exam that says that they know how to navigate through their community uh, by bike and be able to get, you know, get around. And what's interesting about that is that when you have a safe systems approach like the Dutch have, they're learning it on really, you know, appropriate and, and highly safe environments because it's safe for them to do so yeah you hit the nail on the head it's not unsafe to send your child out in traffic um uh yeah yeah definitely and if you think about it like the dutch end and if we design we know and we have data that if we design roads for the most vulnerable road users we're making it safe for everybody including those that are um driving a car Right. Um, and, and same goes true for if we think about designing for all ages and abilities. So the kids and the elderly, um, thinking about signal timing, mm-hmm. it takes longer for kids and elderly persons to get across the street. So why do we time signals for um, assuming that people are able-bodied because then we're leaving people behind um, physically and metaphorically in a crosswalk, yeah, um, who may need more time to get across the street. And obviously it may slow things down, but like we're making things safer. And when we say slowing things down, thinking about the concept of time, um, everybody's always in a rush to get places, but going two miles above a speed limit, two miles per hour, right? in the US. If you're like, we know that most drives, most distances are short, like just thinking about how much time are you actually saving by speeding, by putting people's lives at risk. Um, I think that how we communicate those things are are really important. Um, I love this photo. Um, My face, like I look so like annoyed uh because i was pushing a friend of mine across the street actually in dc this photo is probably about 10 years old now i'm dating myself um but uh yeah so i think just thinking about how people get across the street safely uh reducing kinetic energy forces making sure those that um are most vulnerable if they were to get struck making sure that um, uh, it's not going to result in a fatality. All those concepts actually make the whole system safer for everybody rather than making it faster for just cars. So right. hope to see that shift in our profession. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why don't you give the backstory on this uh, on this particular photo? Yeah, definitely. So um, I actually, as I mentioned, have a degree in architecture. And um, very early on in my architecture student career, I got involved in a group called the American Institute of Architecture Students. Um, And it's still uh, um, an organization that I stay involved in. And it's how I became a leader um, kind of in any profession that I've ever been involved in. But while I was on that board of directors as a student, we started a program called Freedom by Design. Design. Um, and it was mostly teaching architecture students how to think about building codes, because you're really not taught that in architecture school. But then it also, those architecture students um, went out into the real world, they found a client, so they had to learn budgets as well as codes. Um, and they had to work with an actual client to get a product 
built. Um, it included mostly architecture related things, um, things like making a, a bathroom handicap accessible, making a kitchen handicap accessible, building a ramp to a structure. And the clients were usually um, uh, didn't have the means themselves to make their home more accessible. Um, so the chapters would raise funds. But um, the leaders of the Freedom by Design chapters at every architecture school across the country, we would bring them out to DC every year um, and give them leader, provide leadership training, but then also the basics of how to run a freedom by design chapter. And we also do a monument walk out here in DC. Um, and we do noise canceling headphones, um, blindfolds, um, and wheelchairs so that the students who are going to be doing these freedom by design projects, they understand what it is, what it feels like to navigate the built environment um, with, uh, with, uh, those, um, those disabilities, um, being deaf, being blind, being in a wheelchair. Um, and what's interesting, even though they're focused on interior or building related items, we have them cross streets so that they understand the purpose of a tactile warning strip, um, the purpose of, uh, what height, a, a pedestrian push button should be at now, why it should be in recall, um, how much time it takes to cross the street. And also one of the most important things with uh, ADA accessible ramps is we do the monuments um, in a wheelchair so that they understand the reason why an ADA ramp should be the 210 slope that it is and not any greater. Because uh, um, an interesting fact is the National Park Service does not have to adhere to ADA guidelines. So a lot of the ramps around the monuments in Washington, D.C. are not ADA accessible. Wow. Yeah. That's really shocking. <laughs> yeah. I, and it's so powerful, right? To, to be able to give uh, architecture students this opportunity to, to be able to experience it, but also being able to get, uh, you know, other people that ability to uh, see and feel what it's like to be out there in our public realm and on our streets and experiencing that and and this next shot is is just that i mean it, it's it, it's somebody's you know experiencing it and so what what's the backstory on this and who is this fellow yeah. Um, so uh, I mentioned that I've worked in nonprofit, um, in public agency and in um, consulting. And while I was running a community design program within a land trust on Maryland's eastern shore, um, that's uh, really where I professionally got involved in green and complete streets. So this is a project in Cambridge, Maryland, where we built the first green and complete street actually in a rural town um, in Maryland. And and this is uh, a city council member from that city. Um, uh, and we went through a process of teaching everybody in the community, including the elected officials, the benefits of complete streets. But instead of telling them um, the benefits, we showed them the benefits. Um, so we started uh, by doing uh, community input boards all across town to hear what they wanted. The project was called Cambridge Gateways, what they wanted their gateway to be like. Um, we um, would we went in front of city council and I'll never forget all of the city council members were like, what is a bike share? Um, and we told them what it was from a, from a transportation planner's perspective, but we knew that we had to show them. And this concept of if you build it, they will come is something that I've found um, helpful in incrementally moving the needle um, with, uh, with new types of planning and transportation treatments um, on projects. So we actually worked with 3M on this project and we at first put down temporary bike sharrows. Those are the ones that um, wear off over time and they're meant to be used in like construction zones. We put those down, um, we trained the public works department how to properly install um, 
a bike share out to the manual on uniform traffic control devices, the MUTCD. Um, but then we also left it down for three months. And uh, we showed the city that if you have this infrastructure, people start to use it. And then this was actually um, the full, um, we did a green and complete street, uh, green meaning the um, stormwater infrastructure. But then we also did permanent bike lanes that had uh, the green backing on the bike symbol um, in order to make the bike lane more visible at intersections. We did not do the full green um, pavement marking down the entire bike lane because the vehicle throughput on this street was not high enough, but we wanted to make it high visibility since this was really the first bike lane in town. Um, so um, yeah, this we did a ribbon cutting, a lot of kids, um, first responders, people that lived on this street came out because we moved, we did the project with them, not for them or at them. So we did a ribbon cutting to kind of celebrate the fact that it actually was done. And we did a bike ride. It was a quarter mile segment, so not very long, but we did a bike ride. Um, and then we did a ribbon cutting. You can see very diverse um, representation in the ribbon cutting. And we really just tried to make it the community's project versus a project being done in the community. So, and um, I'm pleased to report that this uh, uh, complete street is still in place. Um, and now they have a whole bike network in the city of Cambridge. And a uh, fun fact about the city of Cambridge, Maryland, they actually host a full Ironman um, yearly. So it's kind of become a biking and active transportation community. And this is the um, main road that you use to enter the town. Yeah, I see what you mean, too, about the, the number of kids that uh, showed up for the ribbon cutting. And, and, and the yeah, trying of, to hunt down those yeah. big scissors that are in the mayor's hand. Um, uh, yeah. That was one of the funnest tasks ever is trying to find giant scissors. Giant for a scissors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I had to move your photo, too, because you're, you, you were blocking some of the, the kids. And I was like, nah, nah, we got to move her. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love technology when it actually works. This is good. I know, right? <laughs> so, all right. So, so and this, this project was some time ago, right? Yeah, this was, oh man, like seven years ago, seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the relevance of that project in, in that location, um, was pretty significant. Like you said, there, the, the community itself is, is going through, uh, a, a shifting and, and going through a, an evolution of, of sorts, uh, you, you had mentioned, you know, the fact that yes, there's an Iron Man there, and so there's there's an increase in the number of people happening. So, I believe that, uh, yeah, this particular article that you shared uh, with me is from uh, 2019, and it talks a little bit more about the fact that after what was it, you know, maybe seven years, or you know, I guess it was 2012, 2014, when it originally went in, and. Uh, Talk a little bit about that, the the relevance of that. Let me pull this article up here. Yeah, definitely. When I was preparing for this yeah. podcast, trying to figure out what to send to you to yeah, kind of yeah. like give us food for thought and things to talk about. Um, I found this article um, uh, from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation mm -hmm. um, that was kind of tracking this project um, after its implementation and the impact that it had on the community. So I stumbled on this to find that so many years later, they were still talking about how this initial project in the community kind of really was instrumental and moving things, um, moving things forward um, across the entire community. And that um, now kind of on every street, um, they think about the environmental impact of, of streets in that community. You can't see it well in the photos that I sent you, um, but um, yeah, you can see it. So there's obviously bioretention facilities, right. which the community helps plant, clean up, um, uh, maintain every year. Um, there's also, and I think there's a close up photo of there's per permeable concrete. Yeah, um, there sure is. It is right yeah, here. Yeah, there's permeable concrete sidewalks and then there's uh, uh, pavers in the parked car lane mm -hmm. um, just to designate the different treatments for the different uses, but then also it has environmental benefits. Um, there's a filter on the parked car lane so that oil and, um, and other uh, um, 
toxic materials from vehicles don't seep into the bay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of environmental treatments that we also try to use the different treatments to inter- indicate the different uses. So it's a multifaceted um, approach. Uh, so it was kind of funny to see that so many years later, like 2013 to 2019 um, or 2012 to 2019, that they're still talking about this project um, as having been instrumental. And as a planner, that's so rewarding to see that the projects that you're doing are transforming communities. And like I said, if you bring a community along, they're going to make it they're going to understand the changes better than you just telling them about the benefits and the changes. Um, And then they also feel ownership towards their project. I think that's why even to today, um, the community helps uh, clean up trash from the bioretention facilities or plant new plants um, in the springtime and things like that. So it just makes for a better place for everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So, A lot of the work that you've been doing more recently has been focused more on safe systems. Talk a little bit about that work and some of the things that you're passionate about. Yeah, definitely. Um, So as you know, um, uh, Vision Zero has been a focus in in the United States for some time. However, unfortunately, in many places, we have not seen an actual decrease in um, the um, declines and fatalities, even though many agencies, uh, many jurisdictions have passed resolutions um, in hopes of eliminating traffic fatalities by 2030, 2050, whatever the year is that they um, they have set forth. Um, and uh, um, with the safe system approach, we've learned from other countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Norway, the Netherlands, um, that really kind of sa- the safe system approach is how those c- countries successfully got to zero um, or reduced fatalities. Um, so the safe system approach has five elements that have to be all thought about together. So you can see the safe system wheel. We don't like to think of those as principles because you have to think about safe road users safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care all together systemically, rather than thinking about like just safe vehicles or just safe speeds um, or just certain road users. Um, uh, And then the principles, I think, are what are most critical to shifting the way we think about transportation projects to prioritize safety, that no matter who you are, whether whether you're an engineer, a planner, um, a road user, that death and serious injury should not be accepted on our roadways. In the U.S., we kind of, we know that uh, transportation fatalities are an epidemic in in our country, but it seems to still be accepted, even though we see over 36,000 deaths a year on our roads. Um, We know that humans make mistakes, but that, like, That mistake should not result in a fatality. So reducing kinetic energy forces so that if a crash does happen, it doesn't result in a fatality. Um, uh, And thinking about kinetic energy forces um, for the most vulnerable road user that is using the roadway so that like in the case of like, say, a pedestrian, we know what speed at which a pedestrian is at risk for serious and fatal injury. So if there's a lot of pedestrians present or even one, um, we shouldn't be having cars drive over that speed that is safe for the most vulnerable road user. And so those principles, I encourage everybody to take a look at them because it is it articulates how we should be, be thinking about our transportation system differently, both as designers of the transportation system, which is the most critical, um, as well as a user of the system. Yeah, this graphic you see in many different ways. So this is from a AAA study um, that measured the impact um, that speeds have on pedestrians because they're the most vulnerable road user. When I say vulnerable road user, I mean um, they're not protected by a car. They're not protected by steel. Um, so they're at, they're at higher risk of getting killed in, in a traffic crash. So we know um, the survivability. Um, we also know that the higher the speed, the longer the braking distance for a car, the longer the reaction time before you even hit um, that brake. Um, um, Man, we're in sync on this this time, John. You know exactly where I'm going next and have them up. I love this. So yeah, taking all those things into consideration, we have to think about how we're designing the system for 
safety first and then mobility. Um, because the, the reduction in, in uh, mobility is actually not that impactful, but the, the, the increase in safety can have huge, um, huge dividends in saving people's lives. Yeah. One of the, the most tragic things that we have seen uh, as our speeds, our motor vehicle speeds have crept up is is just the fact that we, we are seeing that shifting of uh, of impact towards the more vulnerable roadway users and street users. Uh, it's getting safer and safer and safer inside the motor vehicle and less safe outside of the motor vehicle. And so as those speeds, you know, go up and, and, and the previous graph, you know, showed that. You yeah. Know, and as yes, cars get bigger. Exactly. Um, and the cars obviously. are getting much bigger too. And so you're, again, you're getting there, but here's a, here's a factor that as the speeds creep up, the ability of the driver to be able to uh, avoid a, a crash is, is a critical thing. So not only is it the re reaction difference, but it's also the field of vision difference. And so we have this uh, field of vision thing. So let's move you uh, out of the, the area here. We'll put you right in there and I'll, yeah, I'll kind of stay up in Yeah, and something that's interesting about field of vision and, mm -hmm. and us as planners and designers of the transportation system is we know that field of vision changes as speed increases, which is what this graphic is showing. Yep. But then we also know that if you narrow a driver's field of vision, they will slow down. Right. Um, this concept of target speed, which is getting people to drive the speed we want them to go and not any faster than the posted speed limit. And the posted speed limit should be that that is safest for all road users um, that are using that road segment or the system. Um, and the thing to think about is narrower travel lanes are really critical to get getting people to drive the speed that is safe to go for all road users. Um, and I'll go back to another thing kind of with the safe system approach, which is kinetic energy forces, um, which is like what all of this thinking about kinetic energy forces is connected to. But if you have vulnerable road users present, it's not necessarily just about speed because we know that we have roads like arterials that just have a higher speed and they're not ever going to be able to be 20 miles per hour, right? We have road classifications worldwide. Um, but if you have to have a car go at a higher speed and we know like the we know the speed at which like a person in a bike lane or a pedestrian is vulnerable to getting killed we need to separate those users in space and time so that if a crash does occur it doesn't result in a fatality i would use the comparison of in europe you see um bollards right everywhere you don't yeah. see flex posts, a flex post, um, a delineator like what we use in the U.S. We don't want the car to have damage, right. but that delineator is not going to stop a car from hitting a pedestrian on a sidewalk, a bicyclist in a bike lane. So thinking about those barriers that are actually going to separate users in space if a crash does occur. So it goes back to that humans make mistakes, redundancy is critical, um, so that if a crash does occur, it doesn't result in a fatality. So that's like the lens at which we should be thinking about these things. And it's so funny, going all the way back to Safety Town at the start of our conversation, like I now look at Safety Town very differently too. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that, that I think there's an opportunity to, uh, to, to actually create safety towns that, um, that actually are, are also projecting out. And, and, and what I'm saying here is it can actually project out what we'd like to see in terms of infrastructure and teaching not only kids, but also adults, you know, what, what proper infrastructure, you know, could, could end up looking like. And so you, you, you've got a situation, you know, here and you've got, Oh, okay. We've got all this, this interesting stuff here. What better way than to, to transform a safety town into, we're going to have a continuous uh, elevation sidewalk, you know, crossing, you know, here. And Oh, by the way, we're going to have protected and separated bike infrastructure in here. And, and yeah, you where see are where the I'm, bump outs? Exactly. There's, and, and there's a signal further down in the safety town. I don't mm -hmm. think you can see it. Yeah. Um, but like 
I was just walking with a, a, a friend of mine on a street and there was a leading pedestrian interval in right. the signal timing, again, separating users in time. Right. Um, and even though the pedestrian signal had said walk and there was a countdown, um, yep. she as a road user was like, no, the tr- traffic signal hasn't changed to green yet. We can't go. And I was like, no, that's a leading pedestrian interval. It gets the pedestrian into the crosswalk before the cars start moving. (laughs) And it was so funny, like walking with someone who isn't in transportation system, thinking about how we articulate these new things so that um, going back to the bike lane story in Cambridge, Maryland, so that road users understand it. Like right in the U.S., we don't retrain um, drivers to get their driver's license renewed. And I think right. that has a lot to do with it. Like, I know that our industry talks about um, hawks yeah. or uh, and things like that. Like, how do we expect a driver to understand that? How do we expect a pedestrian to understand that if right. we're introducing this new traffic control devices? So, man, we need to redesign a um, safety town together, John. I, you know, it just it seems to me that it's it, it would not only uh help behoove, you know, and train the next generation for the infrastructure that we're going to be building out over the next, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 years, because it's going to happen. This stuff takes time. (laughs) It it takes time, but we're going to have it. And it's like, okay, let's, you know, because that's the great advantage that the Dutch children and the the children who, you know, who grow up in in Sweden and also in, in Copenhagen have, is they're actually training out there in the safe systems, you know, uh, environment that they're at. And, uh, you know, what better way than to, to help educate the future generations than to show them, you know, hey, this is what's really possible. And if you build it like this, guess what? That actually changes behavior. Yeah, and I think we have the conduit and the potential to do so in other ways. I mentioned yeah. Safe to Roots to Schools projects, yeah. which have honestly been some of the most rewarding projects I've ever been involved in in my career as a planner. Yeah. Um, but then transportation alternatives. There's a lot of paths to fund these type of things. And I think training everyone that uses our road system, um, how to think about these things differently, we'll see that we'll see that change and that acceptance of these kind of new things. Like I know roundabouts, everybody's like, oh, but I don't know how to drive through a roundabout Um, and things like that. I think that like if you move the needle together, there's more understanding with these new traffic control devices because we know they work. They work all over the world. And we should be thinking about how to do them in the U S and like the U S isn't so different that we have to completely reinvent the wheel. Like our traffic control devices might look a little different, but it's not like we have to like completely reinvent these things. We know that protected intersections roundabouts reduce those kinetic energy forces at intersections, create less conflicts like, right. Thinking about car versus car, you have less left turning movements, right. Turning movements. Um, things like that with protected intersections and and roundabouts. So just thinking yeah. it, about it through a different lens is how we'll move the needle. Yeah. And, I, and, and since you mentioned roundabouts, and I was just right on that particular slide, so I wanted to go to it. Um, and of course, in the United States, we're starting to see more and more roundabouts, but most of the design of the roundabouts are turbo roundabouts and high speed multi-lane roundabouts. And they're really infrastructure for facilitating throughput of motor vehicles versus prioritizing uh, the safety and well-being of more vulnerable (laughs) road users. And so, uh, you know, that's one of our biggest challenges is kind of shifting that mindset of of what it is we're measuring and what are the standards that we have there. And so there is a concept out there. Many of the the listeners and viewers of of this podcast know that there's something called LOS or level of service. And it's something that, you know, engineers and planners are designing towards is we need to be able to keep the, that, that facility performing at a certain level and moving cars through I think that we should change what LOS stands for, and it should be level of safety, not level of service. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Both level of safety, and there's another metric that we use for bike networks a lot called, called level of traffic stress. But I think the root yeah. of the problem with with LOS, no matter what we 
call it, whatever that that acronym uh, stands for, is we don't measure road users in the same way. We right. have measures and standards for cars. We don't have measures or standards for other modes. And if you, again, compare the U.S. to other countries, uh, the way we measure um, our roads in other countries is people. Right. versus cars. So I think until we have a consistent measure for multiple modes um, uh, to kind of measure how to design the environment for all road users, and again, to understand like the the level at which if you have mode shifts, how you should be designing the road to encourage more people to walk or bike. Exactly. That is just as critical as measuring the current usage. Um, this is a photo of a, a roundabout in uh, West Palm Beach. And um, you talked about like kind of high throughput roundabouts. Um, and I think the devil is in the details. That's one of my favorite quotes from Daniel Burnham, although to go all the way back to my architecture background, um, um, is that like, right, a roundabout we know is safer, but the devil is ultimately in the details and how we design that roundabout. Like a lot of roundabouts in the U.S. don't have pedestrian accommodations. Right. And thinking about where that crosswalk is in relation to the vehicle approach, the yield, like there being two yields, um, you'll see that there's a raised crosswalk here. So all of those details are really, really critical to the system being safe. Right. Um, for everyone and people understanding how to use the, the system. Um, right now in the um, proposed changes to the MUTCD, there's kind of this gray area with roundabouts, whether or not bike facilities are permitted within a roundabout. And it's like we know that um, uh, in the Netherlands that um, uh, multimodal roundabouts work as long as, again, you separate those users in space and time. Right. Um, so having a cycle track on the outer ring as well as a sidewalk on the outer ring of a roundabout is really important. But there's this gray area in the U.S. about whether or not like bike facilities are permitted in a roundabout. And some some people interpret that as no, bike facilities can't be in a roundabout. And I think we need to provide more pedestrian accommodations in roundabouts. So not just thinking about that kind of what you talked about at the beginning um, of this portion where we pulled this up, which is thinking about getting cars through a roundabout. It needs right. to be getting people through a roundabout safely. Yeah. And and it also begs the, the question of, especially when we start looking at our downtown streets and our more urbanized streets and our shopping streets and, and areas, um, is what is the purpose of a street? And, you know, you and I had, had talked about before about, you know, the strong towns approach of, of the street being the platform for the, the development and building of wealth and prosperity for a community. It's like the street has for thousands of years been the area where things happened, <laughs> you know, if people came together and it's, it's our largest public realms and it hasn't been and, and you know, that transformation has been relatively recent. The last 80 to 100 years is where we have seen, we've given up our streets as people, given them over to motor vehicles. And so that tension of that fundamental difference is, well, how, how do we measure the success of this street? Maybe it's how beautiful it is and how productive it is and how much, how desirable it is for people to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can we phone a friend? Can we phone uh, Chuck into this podcast? Sure, that would sure. be a great conversation. <laughs> He's probably um, making cookies right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm here for that um, as we get closer to the holidays. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we know that uh, people streets, um, uh, environments that are built for all road users, all agent ages and abilities are more pleasant to live in thinking about like green streets, the more street trees you have, they narrow the tunnel of vision, which makes speeds decrease. Like, right. That's an easy traffic calming solution, but then who doesn't love like a street with trees um, on it? Like thinking about how people enjoy the built environment, it kind of like all comes full circle, right? Like, right. If you make a safe environment for all road users, it's actually a more, pleasant place to be. Um, when I was at the land trust, um, doing community design, our kind of, uh, strategy or approach was that in order to keep our rural places, rural, 
um, with conservation e- easements and things like that. We had to keep those rural town centers vibrant and things like complete streets and thinking about the interaction of building to street, um, uh, sidewalk cafes, uh, multi-use buildings, things like that, um, planting trees, making green space, parks, um, making it safe makes it just a more vibrant and pleasant place for people to be. But um, it takes some education and some training and some understanding to like move that needle. So people like, right, we we as people like are creatures of habit. We right. we in, interact with what we know. So you have to show them how like what is different is going to improve people's lives. Yeah. And so uh, one of the other ma- main projects that you have been working on is is curbside management stuff. And, yeah. Um, I'm going to move your, your photo around here so we're not blocking any of the, wor- the words here and all that. So and and you just said, you know, one of the most important aspects is, is for people to be able to touch it and feel it and, and, and understand it. And of course, uh, what had happened in the last you know two years now with the pandemic is the many communities, many streets, especially the downtown main streets, have been reimagining what the curbside is for and what it could be for and what is needed. And so there's a bunch of different little um, uh, indicators on here. Why don't you walk us through this whole concept of curbside management and, and why this matters? Yeah, so um, curbside manage- management is essentially like a public agency managing the curb space. Um, and the curb is like the physical curb where you see signage and markings that indicate where things are and aren't allowed. Um, kind of the curbside is either side of the curb um, where you usually have to like end a mode, store a mode, switch a mode. Um, so this uh, graphic indicates uh, the user and uses at the curb um, that you primarily have to think about. But this, of course, doesn't cover everything. Like I think of just like basic stuff like uh, bus stops, um, um, fire hydrants, how to efficiently design the curb for the highest and best use um, at a given time based both on demand as well as how you want to shift um, uh, mode. So, right. If you need, uh, if you want to shift towards more active transportation, people biking, for example, you should probably think about bike storage. Um, uh, we know that we've seen a lot of healthy, um, slow streets arise during COVID-19, but then we've also seen a lot of, um, people streets arise, uh, outdoor dining parklets being in the curb lane. So balancing all of those things kind of in the curb lane and then thinking about like, like even your sidewalk width, how much space do you have between a building and that edge of curb so that you can optimize those interactions and still make it um, uh, safe and accessible for all people to use the curb side, either side of the curb so that on the street side, you don't have double, double parking for freight um, and things like that. But then on the sidewalk side, making sure that you have enough room for people. Uh, I always use the kind of micro example of sidewalk signs. If you don't make the sidewalk wide enough, but then you allow sidewalk signs within your jurisdiction, you're potentially limiting somebody in a wheelchair from safely getting through. So just thinking about all those user users and uses that have to use the curbside and making sure that we accommodate for, for both um, the people that are there, as well as the people that we want to be there or no need to be there, but don't currently have those accommodations. So that's kind of a very high level of curbside. Yeah, yeah. And we see a you know whole bunch of really interesting you know things here. We we obviously see the green infrastructure and the parklets and the streetscapes, and we see uh, off to the side there are the food trucks and the and uh, obviously one of the things that has uh, come up with with the pandemic is uh, the cafes have been you know trying to create additional outdoor seating, and so we see some of the curbside being reimagined as a, as space uh, for 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 commerce even. And, uh, and, and viewing that as much more flexible is, is, is something that I think is, has been a, a positive that has come out of, uh, you know, a, an absolutely devastating pandemic, um, because it's, it's given people 
and cities uh, an opportunity to reimagine what our streets are for and what that space is for, that curbside space. And you're absolutely right too. I mean, is it? You, you, I'm looking, you know, just to to the side of my photo here, or my image, is the uh, the bicycle in, in infrastructure, and we think about how parking, uh, car parking is 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 the ability to to affordably and cheaply, maybe free, park a personal private vehicle on a curb. More important than. A, an active mobility, a protected and safe environment for, for people to, to be able to get around. Uh, maybe through creativity where we reimagine, okay, how do we do this? Maybe if we, we have enough space, maybe we keep parking and, and make it parking protected active mobility facilities. And so it's just, it's, it's a really exciting time right now that this is all happening. I think you had mentioned to me that this development was all happening just prior to the the pandemic. Is that correct? Yeah. So we actually, um, I worked on a um, curbside inventory guide with uh, Federal Highway Administration, which was actually released um, in July of 2021 and in the midst of the pandemic. And we didn't specifically, we did not start the project because of the pandemic or it doesn't specifically reference the pandemic, but it's, it's kind of, if you take principles at a high level and apply them based on kind of what's going on in the world, let it be safe system or curbside management. Like you can kind of like think about the bigger uh, picture, which is the system. Um, with curbside management, I think one thing that's interesting with like flex zones is mm-hmm. I think we used to think of uh, curbside management as um, allocating a certain amount of space to a use at all hours of the day, whether right. it be parking storage. There may be times of day that you need to have no parking on a street or have parking on a street for vehicle storage, like overnight in residential areas, for example. Um, but then there's other times of day where like, right, we think of it for like bus stops, um, snow routes, um, things like that, but we don't necessarily think about it for other uses based on a time of day. We also like in kind of the curbside management realm, we adjust kind of parking storage for things like major events. That's an example of flex zones that have been kind of happening um, kind of for a while within agencies. Get a special permit because you're having a major event because you're, you know, you're going to have more pickups and drop offs. So you need like a loading zone um, for pickups and drop offs. But then you also have to think about it like you can do that. You can apply that to kind of everything that we do. And that's where flex zones come in and curbside management is like at a given time of day, you may need more space for walking, more space for biking, more space for outdoor dining rather than permanently allocating a space along the curb for a use that really only needs it at a certain time of day. Think about freight. Usually deliveries happen at a certain time of day. So coordinating those efforts so that you're making that space available for those that need it at that given time and not allocating it and having wasted space because there's only so much right away um, for a space that doesn't need to use it 24-7. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll pull up this uh, this image here just because it, it it also gives a a couple of interesting things here. It's the performance. Yeah, there's so much stuff happening at the curb you don't realize it until you start thinking about curbside management through kind of the yeah. lens of a transportation planner. Yeah, and, well, and the reason I like this too is it 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 helps exemplify several different types of things, just like you were what you were saying, and and the adding in that additional layer or level of, okay, what about flex? You know, what could this space be, you know, at this time, you know, it's easy to roll in, you know, the hot dog vendor and, and, you know, et cetera. So yeah, point well taken uh, on the, that beautiful opportunity to be more flexible about how that space is being used. Yeah, especially if we have, as we have like more uses and uses, the evolution in curbside management I kind of think about is you had like scooters, e-bikes, yeah. you had, well, you had bike share, then you had e-scooters, e-bikes, then you had food trucks um, kind of happening at the same time. And now you have kind of uh, outdoor dining spilling into the curb space, the things in response to the pandemic, more space for walking and biking. So there's kind of been this like incremental change that the only way we're going to be able to accommodate all of those things is thinking about a use that needs it or should need it at a given time and allocating that space kind of hourly rather than daily or forever. 
<laughs> for an eternity. For Parking eternity. storage for eternity. Yes, car storage <laughs> for eternity. No. <laughs> we also need to phone a friend, bring in Donald Shoup to talk about the high cost of free parking. Well, yeah. And, and fortunately, uh, um, uh, the Shoup dog was a guest on our podcast. And so that's a classic uh, episode uh, from season two. So make sure if you mm-hmm. haven't uh, already listened to that one, uh, go back, folks, and and dial into that. But yeah, I, I do need to get him back on uh, since we're starting to produce more video uh, podcasts and, and he's got some really great, uh, animated videos. So that, that'd be fun to get him back on. So real quickly, uh, is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure we, uh, leave the audience with? No, I mean, She's you talk about so heads. much. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no, you talk it, I mean, I am also a lover of the active towns podcast. I watch it. Um, we were just talking about before we started recording the episode one Oh one, um, that I'm excited to watch that actually came out today as we're recording this one. I just, yeah, I mean, there's so many things to think about and I just appreciate the active towns podcast podcast, you giving a conduit to those of us that are working in this space and doing things in this space um, to talk about how we can do things differently and kind of move that needle more more towards active transportation um, and active people and safe and healthy environments for all road users. So yeah, I'm sure whatever we didn't cover in this podcast, you'll you'll catch in another podcast in the future. And another episode and, and another time. Well, okay, then I do have another question for you then. What would be your best day ever? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I will say, and I know I sent you a text from a resident in the town of St. Michael's where I was working. Mm -hmm. I think professionally feeling like I'm improving people's lives on the ground. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, not moving them necessarily the needle big picture, but that the work I'm doing as a planner, um, is saving someone's life. And I think it goes back to me being raised by a first responder, um, a firefighter and police officer, um, Uh, My dad did both and he gets made fun of for it. So I think that just like really, really making sure that the work I'm doing is helping people and not hindering people. Um, I will also say I love experiencing new places by bike. The things that you see and interact with, I think, are just a lot more like humanistic. So I love whenever I'm visiting cities, I love riding a bike through any city because just the way you experience the city is is different. So I just think, uh, knowing professionally, I'm saving a person's life, um, through the work that I'm doing or saving lives, hopefully. But then I also walk and bike and, um, and enjoy biking. Like it's my relaxation time, um, as just a human being. So, um, balancing those two and getting those two in a day would probably be my answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Now you have some travel planned. Yeah, I'm headed what's, off what's, to Paris. Okay, very good. Okay, that's excellent. And you're are you, you're you're going to try to squeeze this trip in before this podcast gets uh, posted, correct? Yes. <laughs> I know we might need to do another (laughs) update. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to Paris for um, a few days. Um, I've been to Paris before, but actually fun fact, I was, uh, I have a friend who maps um, all of their favorite restaurants in a city across the entire world. Um, So they shared their Google map with me this morning of their favorite, um, their favorite restaurants. Um, And uh, they've been to Paris in 2018. But while I was looking at Google maps, I was fiddling around with stuff. And in Paris, they have all the people's streets mapped in Paris. So um, I'm going with a non-transportation friend um, (laughs) and I'm probably going to make her go experience some of the car-free zones. Um, As we know, Paris recently reduced speed limits um, in the um, center of the city. Um, And obviously they have people streets. So I'm going to go check some out. Um, I was recently actually in Italy, um, as well. And another friend who was traveling with me, who's also not in transportation was making fun of me because I spent like an hour at a multimodal roundabout. It had a bus, it had a tram, it had a 
uh, a separated bike lane. It had a um, designated pedestrian signal um, uh, where it was just like a pedestrian scramble mixed with a roundabout. Um, like it had mopeds, it had motorcycles. Like uh, it was like the most multimodal roundabout I've ever seen. It was in Milan. <laughs> um, and Cats I may have and dogs you a video mixing. Of it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How dare they? So, <laughs> and okay. I literally was like, oh, and I think I might have sent you the video of it, but oh my gosh, it was the most oh, multiple did, yes. roundabout. And man, it was magic. But my friends who aren't in transportation was like, they're what always like, doing? can what we be done? Doing? Can we go now? Yes, you did send me that video. So I I, I will uh, do this for the the audience. Uh, you know, I'll make sure that when we we edit this out, we're gonna we'll we'll have a little uh, a little clip from the the Milan. So that'll be part of the the outro uh, to the video. Is the right? Uh, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. <laughs> so yeah, here's your assignment for for next week. So hopefully you're going to be here so that we can uh, launch this podcast episode on Friday live in the morning or the afternoon, we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate that. And, uh, but, uh, your assignment, well, during next week when you're traveling is to, uh, capture some of the amazing work that is going on in Paris right now, because it, it's truly amazing, uh, the, the steps that they're making, uh, to transform the environment. They really are getting serious. Uh, Mayor Hidalgo is, 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 committed to making Paris much more people friendly. And it's, and it really is. I mean, in 2015, when I was there for the very first car free day, the quote that she had in the newspaper was, we've got a problem. We can't even see the Eiffel Tower through the, the exhaust and through the smog. We have to do something different. And so uh, Paris is going to be so much better because Paris became beautiful and amazing prior to the automobile. And then the automobile has, has really uh, diminished the, the quality of life uh, of, of that fine city. And so it'll be interesting to see some of the progress and, and that you see on the ground. So since I can't be there next week with you, that's your assignment is to, is to bring back some of the goods, some good fo- yeah, photography and some videos. Is- yeah, we know that urban renewal happened all over the world, like yes. in the 1950s and 1970s. And we know that like a lot of European cities have undone the things that didn't work. And right. I, it, like the U.S. is still figuring out how to undo these things, um, whereas yes. Europe has already undone them. Like look at the Netherlands. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there were highways r- running through cities and they've turned them into um, t- into other environments that are safer for all road users. So, yeah, yeah. I will definitely do that. And I know that um, Paris, like Paris in a lot of places, and I think the U.S. Has, is starting to think about these changes, but everything is connected, like carbon emissions is connected to yes. safety, is connected yes. to multimodal and designing facilities for all road users, improves accessibility and like, equity. Like it's all connected, it's all which is connected. what's so fascinating. But yeah challenging about the transportation system. Well, and it's one of the reasons why we can't just boil it down to one thing and just say safety. I mean, it has to be all of those things to your point. And I think that's a wonderful place to leave this particular yeah. episode is to basically say that, yeah, we, we, we talked a lot today about safety and safe systems and all of that. But at the end of the day, they're healthier. They're fiscally more productive. It's it's all connected, and they're more vibrant yes, and it's more exciting vibrant. for people to yeah, interact yeah. with. So, well, yeah. congratulations on the new uh, job, the new role, and everything. And I look forward to uh, uh, catching up with you again, uh, maybe yeah. in a year or so, uh, on this venue. Sarah, awesome. thank you so very much. Thank you, John, for doing this important work. I am a fan of Active Town, so I was um, very, uh, very excited when you invited me on. Can I do? Can I do a little dance? Because we had no technology issues. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number one hundred and two of the Active Towns podcast. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Sarah, and I look forward to teaming up with her in designing a whole new approach to safety town or traffic garden installations for future generations based on a safe systems approach. To learn more about the safe systems approach and the documents that we discussed, please check out the links in the show notes or more importantly, on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this week's episode. But before I let you go, just a quick reminder, please help me to grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word, and subscribing to our YouTube channel and or your favorite podcatcher. 
thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.